What's up guys, this is Heiss, and welcome back to Railroad 101, where this time we're finally talking about diesel tractive effort and how it's calculated, specifically for diesel electric locomotives. Of course, there's also diesel hydraulics and diesel mechanicals and all those sorts of things. That's way outside my wheelhouse of experience. I know some people who do have that experience, but we'll get to those another time. I started looking into this because I wasn't intrinsically familiar with the calculations and the actual calcs for tractive effort themselves are really, really simple, so we can jump right into those, but the nuance of, that comes with them is always interesting, so let's get into it. Now, for our metric friends, this is a very, very simple thing. For those of us in Imperial, of course, there's some funny numbers that come into play here, but the general form of the equation is really simple. Your tractive effort is equivalent to the power that the engine has times an efficiency factor divided by the velocity or the speed of the train. That's it. So as speed goes up, tractive effort goes down, and that kind of starts to get into the diesel locomotive can't pull a train it can start kind of thing. And that's why we end up seeing so many locomotives on modern day trains. The specific metric equation, they recommend that you use 0.82 for your efficiency factor here. So then this is in watts, this is in meters per second, and then your tractive efforts in newtons. But uh, uh, measuring apples falling out of trees and bonking you on the head doesn't make a ton of direct sense to me for how much a locomotive can pull. So in Imperial, this equation is given by EMD on a long ago published paper, and the exact value that they use for the efficiency factor and simplization is eh, not quite right for every locomotive out there, but it'll get you really close. And honest to God, all these ratings don't take into account what's going on with the track and the rails anyways. So you're never going to truly get exactly this or that rating out of a locomotive once it's in the real world. I digress. But the equation comes out to be tractive effort is equal to very similarly the horsepower of the locomotive times 308, which is our combined efficiency factor and some conversions and all that stuff, divided by miles per hour speed. So either way, no matter what you do, you're talking about how much power does the engine develop multiplied by an efficiency divided by speed. So that means at very slow speeds, you get a significant amount of tractive effort. And they talk about the starting effort of diesels uh, some of the big diesels we have, the starting tractive effort's higher than the big boys. Oh my god, but then why is the big boy pulling a train that usually you see four or five, six locomotives pulling at the same time back in the day, right? Well, that's where the speed piece of it comes in. The best way I've heard it described before is that a steam locomotive is what you would call a constant torque but variable horsepower machine. Above a certain speed, you're able to always generate those forces at the cranks that actually pull the train, but your horsepower changes significantly because it's tied to how fast your wheels are turning. And a diesel locomotive is a constant horsepower, but variable torque machine. The motors supply the most power they can when they're going really slow, and the faster and faster they go, the less torque they give out for the same horsepower input. So because of that variability, like we've talked about before, the horsepower rating doesn't really matter for the steam locomotive because once it can get up to a speed where both the pistons are always supplying force, and you can assume that, which depending on your size of drivers is eight to 15-ish miles an hour, once you get above that speed, the horsepower of the engine does not matter whatsoever. You're gonna be able to pull those sorts of things. However, on the diesel locomotive, the horsepower really adds up and is really important because if you want the train to be able to go anywhere at speed, you're gonna have to have the horsepower to back it up. If we take the diesel's tractive effort and plug it into a graphing calculator, we can kind of see this come to fruition. So if we're using a big 4,400 horsepower locomotive, such as a Dash 9, an SD70 Ace, something like that, one of the big locomotives that you tend to see operate these days, you multiply it by 308, and we have speed in our x-axis here, we can see that up to, you know, the common freight speed, top speed of 70 miles an hour, there's an exponential decay in the amount of force the locomotive can put out. And as you get closer and closer to zero, we asymptotically approach infinity. So the locomotive should be infinitely strong at zero speed, right? Well, 
There's a couple real world factors that prevent that from happening that we'll get to in, in a second. But the point is, at slow speeds, you're getting these huge amounts of tractive effort per these calculations based on what the locomotive is doing that very, very quickly exponentially fall off to a low amount. If we're at 70 miles an hour, that's essentially 20,000 pounds of tractive effort. So a big 4,400 horsepower diesel locomotive can only pull a train as heavy as my little narrow gauge 10 wheeler can, but that's at that speed. So if you wanna be able to run freights that fast, you're gonna need a lot more engines. Now this is all assuming that everything else about the locomotive is set up to achieve this thing, right? If your generator or alternator isn't capable of outputting the power that the motors demand, if you have a ton of traction motors and a small generator, for example, you're not gonna reach these potentials. This is assuming everything's optimized and your alternator's big enough, your traction motors, you have enough of them, and that they're geared properly for these applications and that you've got enough weight on the wheels to actually put that power down. One calculation that people tend to use is just divide the weight on the drivers by four. That's your maximum tractive effort you're gonna get out of the locomotive. Otherwise, it's just gonna be a wheel slipping hound because that's where the friction piece comes in. If you size your electronics and your engine and everything for that, that is theoretically the ultimate maximum effort you could get out of one of these locomotives. I think the key piece in there to understand for a diesel locomotive, or at least one of this type, is the gear ratio piece. Because your traction motor is not directly coupled right on the axle. There is a gear box between them. You can't change gears, there's no shifting, but you're gearing up so that you get a lot more speed and a little bit less torque. And you can gear those things differently because the motor, as an electrical motor, has requirements that you have to meet for it to be able to run. And that is what limits that unlimited power that we talked about at extremely slow speeds. EMD in an older publication basically said that you can gear the traction motors uh, down from 5.6 times to about 2.4 times in there. At 2.4 times, you're getting a lot more speed, a lot less torque, a lot less tractive effort. And at the 5.4 to end of the spectrum, you have a pretty low top speed, but you're getting a lot of tractive effort out of the locomotive. But you do have a minimum speed you need to meet. The electronics in the motors can only bear so much. You have a minimum RPM without breaking the motor that you can sustain continuously, and you have a maximum RPM that the motor can spin before the back electromotive forces actually cause flashover and break the traction motor as well. So there is a hard limit to how slow and how fast a certain locomotive can run at, while trying to apply power, although overspeed is just in general. So if you don't get above the minimum speed of the motor, which varies again with that gear ratio because the miles an hour speed is being translated to an RPM. If you don't get above that minimum speed, you're gonna overload and break the traction motor. So you have to be able to get above and past that. Otherwise things will break. You're talking about replacing motors and those uh, that's a very expensive time consuming process. So even though the math says, oh yeah, it's infinite power, well, it's infinite power until you KO the traction motor, basically, and things are limited to make sure that doesn't happen. You'll note on the control stands of most diesel locomotives, they'll tell you what amperages you can run and for how long, how many amps are we sending through, and some of the numbers are impressively large, but still, there is a maximum amount. So if you can't sustain a speed over the minimum speed, which for some gear ratios is as low as four or five miles an hour, and for some it's as high as almost 20 miles an hour, which is why passenger diesels and freight diesels were a big different thing back in the day. If you can't sustain over that speed, you're not gonna be able to put out that max torque, that max tractive effort that you want to with the locomotive in notch eight. It just won't happen. You electronically cannot complete that and make it work. So this is where your second important rating comes in, and that's the continuous tractive effort of the locomotive. If you can be above that minimum speed based on gear ratio and the motor characteristics, you can continuously apply that much force ad nauseum with no problems, so long as you don't slow down. That's where continuous tractive effort comes in. And you'll see that rating being given out for different locomotives as well. And it's again, just that simple equation. We have horsepower times the number divided by the speed at that particular speed. 
And so at that point, at that slow speed, once you're there, okay, if the train is not too heavy for that amount of tractive effort, you can run that train forever at that speed. But the speed is usually 10 mile an hour, 15 mile an hour, something slow that's not conducive to getting across the country with a lot of tonnage behind you. And that's why you start to see more and more locomotives get added on. And that's also where the horsepower piece of this comes in. And that's why we look at a diesel and say, well, the horsepower is more important because yeah, sure, you could put all this tonnage behind one, slug it out, try and burn it down and live the precision scheduled dream of crawling up the hill at eight miles an hour, praying you don't stall. Uh, sorry for the engineers and conductors who work for the class ones who I just triggered because they're doing that more and more these days, but details. You could do that, but if you want the stuff to get to some place with any amount of expediency, it's all about the horsepower in the terms of a diesel engine. Because almost any of them will try and start those trains, but if you can't meet that minimum, it's not going to keep going. And if you can, well, it's probably going to be pretty slow versus a steam locomotive which will just keep developing the torque. If you pass the bar, if you've got enough tractive effort, steam engine's just gonna take it. That's where that adage comes in. A steam locomotive can pull a train it can't start, and a diesel locomotive can start a train it can't pull. Because the steam engine needs to get up to a certain speed where both the pistons are doing the thing and applying force continuously and smoothly, which takes a little bit of work to get to. And the diesel locomotive's gotta get up to its continuous speed and at, once it does, it's lost so much tractive effort. So that's why you see that, and that's why we prefer tractive effort ratings for steam engines, because that's what matters. And that's why we prefer the horsepower rating for the diesel, because that's what matters. So that's a really interesting comparison. It's why you don't really hear tractive effort get talked about too much in the terms of diesel locomotive, because the railroads just go, okay, how many horsepower per ton do we have? That's all we're trying to solve today. For a certain subdivision, you need a certain amount of horsepower per ton. You get that much horsepower, you're doing simple addition, send it. Done. Wash your hands of it. They don't care about the tractive effort, because once you get the horsepower, you know that you'll make it. And make it at a speed that things hopefully actually get done at, too. So as such, even at a continuous tractive effort rating, if you look them up for things like an SD70, EMD rates it at well over six figures, depending on which type of SD70 you're at. That's approaching big boy, huge steam locomotive articulated type locomotives, right? But even then, that is the continuous rating, but it's gonna do it slower than those steam locomotives did because of those constants and variables we talked about. That's just the nature of the game. So the, the rating really doesn't matter and it's not directly comparable because of the operational characteristics between a steam locomotive and a diesel locomotive. Anyway, that was a whole bunch, a lot of nerdy, weird things and math and details and all that whole stuff. So hopefully it wasn't too much and I hope you guys appreciated it and hope you learned something new and maybe it helped answer a question that you had or two. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you all next time. <laughs>